morning. How are you? I uh, finally got the combination right of having a reasonably fast phone and a reasonably fast computer and reasonably fast internet. So, the good news, or the bad news, whichever way you look at it, is that I'm going to resume doing my videos. The good news is I'm going to resume doing them. And the bad news is they're probably going to be as rubbish as they've always been. <laughs> so, how are you? All right? Everything all right? I can't, uh, I don't have a topic for today. One of the things I've found looking through and processing all the videos I've done so far. So for example, I've done four. Oh, there's a load of water about. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed looking at the ones I've done is that uh, they tend to be, what I'll do is I'll do uh, a video on a certain topic such as uh, macroeconomics and then the next day I'll do another video and it'll end up being on macroeconomics. So I'm going to avoid macroeconomics for a bit even though I think yeah, we are living through the end of the dollar system and the fiat government money system. Bank of England is, uh... oh no, I'm going to hold. Oh, I cough a lot as well, I cough a lot, don't I? That's annoying. I'll try not to cough, or I might cut them out. So, um, Bank of England is talking about negative interest rates. And it's funny because they uh, they start off by saying that they're not uh, thinking about having negative interest rates. And then the next thing they say is that they're not considering negative interest rates. And then they say that they might consider negative interest rates. And then they say that they have considered negative interest rates but they're ruling them out. And then they say that they might not rule them out. And then they say that they might rule them in, but they're not ruling them in at the moment. Do you know what I mean? And it goes on like that for probably three months, six months. Until eventually you get from a headline saying Bank of England unequivocally rules out negative interest rates to a headline saying uh, bank uh, base rate goes negative for the first time. <clears throat> and you can follow this change of uh, narrative. It's called now the narrative, you know. Everybody has a narrative. So, for example, uh, road ahead closed. What, what, what? Oh my God. close these roads they should be in shouldn't they in like Flynn and out now that's going to take me longer to get to work and I was not going to get to work on I mean my Lou my lovely nurse starts at 8.30 the first patient's in at 8.45 I usually turn in at 8 I turn up at 8.44 Today the first patients are, oh I think the first patients are 9.15 so I might be alright. Because I told Lou not to bullet again until 9. And uh, I left at about 8.30 something thinking I'll just wing it in for 9. And now I'm going to have to put another 10 minutes on the journey because I've had to turn around and I'm going back the way I came. So, obviously negative interest rates puts the whole financial system into reverse, doesn't it? So people who are getting money 
from loans are having to pay money to make loans. And people who were paying interest on loans are now being paid to take out loans. And it, it's, a, it's essentially, it's a, it's a weird world, you know, it's a topsy-turvy world where the stock market, uh, the economy's uh, it's gone down the crapper and yet the stock market's at all-time highs. Um, it's very, it uh, would be very interesting to perhaps read the newspapers from, from the last uh, depression, you know, and find out what it was like just on a day-to-day -day basis for people. Because you're, there's, there's a creeping, that, that's the theme, that's going to be the theme of my, my podcast today, it's going to be the, the creeping nature of affairs. So, you're, you find that you're somewhere that you didn't want to be, and you don't know how you got there, because you, you, you thought you are going to be somewhere else. So, so let me clarify that. We didn't think we were going to have negative interest rates, and yet we may well have negative interest rates. Um, really, the only... Uh, reason why they're doing it so slowly is that they're giving everybody a chance to have a think about what it's going to do to all their financial shenanigans if interest rates go negative. Now why would you say, why would anyone pay people to borrow money? Well, generally, the, the sort of the lighthouse that you can stick to is that if inflation starts to go up and if consumer prices start to go up then the way that the government fights that is to um, what happens is people start buying stuff because they they're worried that it's going to be more expensive later on in the year so they start buying stuff and so and they borrow money to buy stuff and so what happens is the government puts up interest rates on borrowing so that uh, and it slows down the, the amount of money that people can get their hands on so if you remember that as a as a given, and there aren't that many givens anymore these days, that um, increased consumer price inflation is fought by increasing uh, interest rates on borrowings, then at the moment the government is trying to stimulate inflation. And so they stimulate inflation by doing the opposite, right? By decreasing interest rates, uh, which is a policy that's worked quite well, except the interest rates are now 0.1% and they can't go any lower. So obviously some bright sparks said, well, what if they could go lower? You know, what if we could put them down to minus 1%, minus 2% or whatever? Surely that would cause inflation. And the government's desperate to cause inflation because they want to inflate away the debt. Holy cow. This is a big puddle. It's a good 100 yards long. This is like a Ford. I'll have to ring people up and tell them that. Why that puddle's there? That I don't remember that puddle being there ten years ago. I think it must be something to do with the uh, fields around here. They're all they're all elevated. The fields and the roads a bit sunk. Yeah. So so coming back to the question, why would you borrow at negative interest rates? Um, and the answer is that. Let, let's say you've got some value, let's say you're going to sell something like a house. Um, then you want to swap it for something that's going to retain its purchasing power. And if you anticipate that money, government issued money, fiat money, is not going to retain its purchasing power because they've, they've got the presses running at full speed, then um, you might want some compensation for borrowing something that's going to lose so much value, right? 
So that begs the question, why would you want to borrow something that's going to lose value anyway? And the answer is it might be the least worst investment. Yeah. So in other words, why would you put your money somewhere, let's say into a government bond, which is basically an IOU, that is definitely going to get paid back because they've got the printing presses to print the money to pay you back, <coughs> but might yield a negative interest rate after inflation is taken into account? And the answer is because you don't want to put your money, for example, in the stock market as an alternative, because while you might get minus 1% on your bond, uh, you might get minus 20% on the stock market if the stock market you know, goes down. So that's the general principle, and that's not really mentioned much. It's like, uh, by accepting uh, negative interest rates, by lending your money at negative interest rates, what you're doing is you're doing the least worst thing. Because you don't want to put it anywhere else. You know, you'd rather get it back and have 1% or 2% less than uh, put it anywhere else and take the risk that you might get 10, 20, 30, or 90% less. So, going back to the narrative of sort of creep, I, I realised this when um, there was a protest by tanker drivers in the UK, petrol tanker drivers, um, and or I think it was lorry drivers, and the lorry drivers union was protesting about the rising cost of diesel petrol. And what they did was uh, they blockaded <coughs> refineries, uh, fuel refineries, and fuel uh, depots. And of course, these lorry drivers were very well placed to know. I mean, I wouldn't know where. Uh, I mean, apart from Canby Island, uh, I wouldn't know where to where to blockade, and I wouldn't know. I wouldn't have a ton of lorries to block the road up. But uh, they did. They had the knowledge and they had the muscle to pretty well bring uh, fuel distribution to a halt. And this was, it was very effective. And the government had to back down and uh, reduce uh, or suspend or freeze uh, fuel duty. And then what happened was uh, over the next few years, two, three, four, five years, the government just put back things exactly as they were. They raised the duty. And it ended up that the petrol was more expensive than it had been at the time of the protest and the question was asked why if the lorry drivers were protesting at £1.50 a litre uh, were they completely quiet when it went up to £1.70 a litre and the answer was that uh, they'd had the time to get used to it they'd had the time to adjust their prices you know they'd had the <coughs> and they didn't have they weren't prepared to uh, commit the um, effort and resources to a strike that they had the first time when they were, um, you know, caught off guard, if you like, and a bit shocked by the by the increase in their input costs. So, <clears throat> another good example, which is contemporaneous, which is one I'll try and stick to current affairs rather than. Uh, than just general macroeconomic theory is uh, the uh, Donald Trump. Now, the Americans, as I as I reminded my wife the other day, have a long and proud history of electing presidents who are totally unsuitable for the job. You know, they elected a. a they elected a Ronald Reagan who was elected because he was a Hollywood actor, who was basically had dementia. They elected uh, the two Bushes, who were both warmongers, and the, the youngest one was frequently compared to a monkey in cartoons because he's, his IQ must have been around the 60, 70 level. And it only got elected because his father had been president. They elected uh, Bill Clinton, whose nickname was Slick Willie, who was basically a sex maniac. And uh, they elected Obama, who was 
very good on social media, but set about bankrupting the um, bankrupting the company by or the country by printing money and just spending, spending, spending. And then they elected a bloke they thought who might be quite good at running the country because he'd been on a business mentoring quiz show type thing where people had to try and demonstrate how good they were at achieving tasks and people thought well perhaps this guy might be might be able to sort of run the country quite well and uh, he, he, he was um, popular with the uh, electorate but most unpopular with the vested interests who believe that they have the, have the right to control Congress and, uh, and the money supply and everything and so um, they very quickly uh, managed to get rid of him for a variety of means uh, but he's leaving he's um i think he's leaving in about a week and that's uh, the inauguration of joe biden and trump's leaving with the highest uh, uh, the, uh, sort of a an approval rating that's on a par with obama when obama left so he's not unpopular and he's leaving after getting more Republican votes than any Republican candidate in history so you can't, you know, on the metrics you can't say he was unsuccessful in any way at all and yet um, his protest uh, the way that the election was won by the Democrats and lost by him um, is the narrative of that is change changes every day you know, the comments, his comments, he's just been impeached for the second time. His, his comments uh, regarding the election being stolen uh, have been ruled by a judge not to be uh, sufficient to uh, constitute, uh, you know, sort of treason or whatever, and, um, and our protected speech under the First Amendment. And yet the narrative that he has tried to take control of the government by force, I think he's more of a, a hysterical reaction than it is anything else. I think the, the, the truth, which may well come out about the election, is that um, Hillary Clinton's election agent, I think, spent all the time since the last election going around the country uh, showing states how to run an effective postal voter service and making sure that um, electors are registered to vote by post and well, with emphasis on the democratic areas. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. <clears throat> and so as a result, they managed to tip, tip the, erection, the, the election in the... Uh, in the Democrats' favour by increasing the total number of votes for both sides, but by, by the Democrats way more. And so as a result, they've won. Now, were there irregularities? Uh, I'm, I'm totally certain that there were. Were they sufficient to constitute uh, a corrupt election? Then no, they weren't. Were, were they, uh, you know, I mean, I don't... I think they may have tipped the result very, very, in a small way, in a few local areas, but not enough to corrupt the entire result. I think the vast increase in postal voting, which was almost certainly entirely legal under the rules as they stand, uh, is, is what tipped it. But Trump's uh, attempt to uh, protest this uh, and explain, I think, to the public what's happened and how the election in his eyes was stolen um, has now turned into a uh, what's the word? insurrection they're accusing him of the, the march on the uh, capital was basically a protest by a bunch of people wearing moose hats and dressed up as Braveheart and a lot of uh, pushing and shoving 
um, although one woman was sadly shot and uh, half of them half a dozen people had heart attacks or whatever um, but that's you know that's now changed the narrative behind that's now changed from being a protest to being an insurrection to the point where the Twitter's uh, banned the president, Facebook, Twitch, all these channels have all, all banned the president. And it's coming to something when, you know, the president doesn't ban Twitter, or Twitter bans the president. Uh, I mean, I think that's a severe blow for free speech uh, and democracy. Uh, when uh, the, the uh, views of Jack, what's his name, um, Trump, the views of the president, the elected president, and now everybody's talking about how the president should be elected, and they're all saying it should be in their way, uh, rather than the, by you know democratically, and all the riots, the democratic, uh, the, the Black Lives Matter riots were not uh, deemed to be. Uh, a major problem although they were obviously very much more of a an event uh, than this single protest and the um, and the um, Trump's comments about the, uh, the you know about his unhappiness about the election are now de deemed to be inciting insurrection whereas uh, all I can remember five years ago was Nancy Pelosi whinging on ad infinitum about how uh, Trump stole the election off of Hillary Clinton and yet at the time she wasn't uh, arrested for treason or whatever you know so it, the whole world as I say is topsy-turvy we're, we're entering some real sort of surreal situation here stock market's up the economy's down the uh, and what's happening is people are just going to work as normal, you know. They're just drawing their monthly or weekly salaries and going down the supermarkets and buying stuff. But you get a feeling that there's some sort, of, there is a pent up. There's something is pent up, you know. The market, as I said in the last podcast, is the market forces will uh, prevail even if it takes them a long time to do it you know they will and no that's the trouble when you get when you get onto um these uh, tv uh shows and they say uh, people what's going to happen and people like peter schiff will say oh the dollar's going to fall in value you know and they go all oh, right well when when is that going to happen and they say when because they what they're really saying is we'd like to trade that we'd like to short the dollar the day before that happens uh, and leverage, you like to do a leverage naked short on the dollar the day before that happens so that we can make a fortune out of you know what, you know, if you're right but the timing is crucial um, if you're um, in any doubt of that you need to watch a film called The Big Short which I fully recommend Christian Bale I've watched it several times one of the few films I have watched several times because I always enjoy it <laughs> Because I know what's going to happen. It's like the opposite of the Titanic. You know the Titanic's going to sink at the end of the film. And you're sad because it's sunk. But um, at the end of the big short, the, uh, the economy's going to sink. But, you know, and, the, and uh, the financial system's going to crack up. But you're actually happy about that. You want that sinking. So you look forward to it. So there we are. Work at last, what's the time? Three minutes past nine. If the patient's coming in at quarter past, then I'm cushy. If they're coming in at nine, Lou's gonna give me a look. A look from Lou you do not want to have. Oh. Right, okay, well, hope you have a lovely day.
It's raining everywhere, so it'll be raining on you. I'll upload some more videos today. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.